I'd like to give a special shout out to Black, Rochester, New York, Buffalo, New York, and the Flying Squirrel. Oh man, pass off to y'all, man. I know y'all are going for a brutal winter. All I gotta do is say, stay strong, you know, for real, because that winter is no joke. I'm really with y'all. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell me a little bit about where you were before you got to this point with the movement and organizing? Like, what, what you were up to? Well, I been basically, I can't say doing the same thing. I was, like, more focused on trying to build a youth organization called Najin, which is Swahili for success. But, like, I had gotten into some legal issues myself, mm -hmm. which kind of put me on the back hole of building up my company. So I had to put that on the back hole. Um, I was actually trying to organize uh, any violence walk from here to Chicago last year. Like that's something I had wanted to do. But then when the legal issues came up, they kind of like put a damper on me actually taking that walk. So it was like in my head last year, you know, around this time, I knew that I was supposed to organize. I knew that I was supposed to prepare stuff and get it together. But I didn't even know why I knew. It was just a natural instinct and just a natural reaction. So it was like, you know, I kind of felt like a sleeper cell. Like the whole my whole life, I felt like when I first understood the concept of a sleeper cell, I like I felt that was me. I felt like I'm I'm here for something much bigger than I think, you know. But it, then, it, the moment hasn't come yet, though. Right, it just hadn't come, and yeah. it was like, what? Well, like, what's the point? What's the purpose? You know what I'm saying? I seen this capitalistic system. I seen white supremacy. I seen oppression at its best. You know, I don't come from the best of neighborhoods, but, you know, and I really didn't have the best of chances afforded to me, but I made the best out of what I was given, mm -hmm. and I was able to succeed and move forward off of that. So, even though it was kind of hard, you know, I, I was just like, it's hard, but why is it hard? Like, I didn't understood, I didn't understand, like, why did my mother have to be on Section 8? Why did my mother have to have food stamps? Why did we have to stay in low-income housing just to make it? And, like, believe it or not, I grew up in a big house. It was just a Section 8 house, but it was a very big house. But you still had the same struggles of your lights going out, um, being hungry and starving, you know. But my mom made the best out of everything she could, so it was just like, I'm grateful for what I got. And, like, yeah. So, um, so how do you identify in the movement? Are you a part of an organization? Do you have, like, how do you, like, what's your role, I guess? I'm part of Tribe X, but my role is to liberate black people, just to get us standing on our own. We need, I want to see what a black Wall Street look like. So I kind of guess, like, that's my point in the role to guide us towards a black Wall Street again, because I want to see what that looks like. I want to see what it is for black people to be able to live in the community and to strive and survive with each other and for each other. I want to see us build up, you know, these these black communities, like, and, and, and not saying going against nobody's ideologies or yeah, yeah. nobody's way of life, but it's just like, why do we have to struggle? Why? How come we can't have the same things. Why can't we be afforded the same things in life and we have built up America's society just like anybody else? So I guess that's my role to get us back on track, to get us liberated, to educate, to empower, to, you know, end all these stereotypes about, you know, people of my color. What does black liberation mean to you? What does that look like? Um, I agree with that. Like, you got to learn how to defend yourself. Um, and when I say defend yourself, it don't necessarily mean attack your aggressor or somebody who you feel like is oppressing you because you don't have to attack somebody physically to get your point across. You can attack people in many different ways. You can attack a person mentally, um, financially, um, morally. You know, it's so many different ways to attack a person. So you got to learn how to defend yourself like systematic um, oppression and racism is a system and if you don't know how to defend yourself from them systems which is education in this case mm -hmm. to offend yourself from white supremacy and systematic oppression you have to learn how to educate yourself and prepare yourself for the economic struggle that just ah excuse me the economic struggle that comes along with that getting tongue twisted mm -hmm. um so yeah you have to prepare yourself for the economic struggle that comes with that in like 
you have to build up this mental capacity and almost put this unfound strength out of nowhere in yourself to, you know, get get black liberation because we have to take a pride in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like we have to get economically aware. We have to educate ourselves on who we were, where we came from, you know, what got us to this point. So, therefore, when we advance out of this stage, we will no longer go back there. Um, History shows us that the first colleges in the whole world was in Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, um, geographically, Africa shows us that it's mostly black people there. You know, it, it, I'm pretty sure it's parts where it's a lot of white people there, but Africa shows you it's mostly black there. Mm -hmm. So you think geographically, like, we did, they never said they put us on the boat and took us to Africa. So if it's all these black people there, you know, that means that that's where the origins first came from. Mm -hmm. You know, so with our origins coming from there, then that means that all the stories we ever heard about Cleopatra and King Tuts and all of them, they were black. They were about black people. Mm -hmm. And you know, so you read the average book about Egyptian culture, and you see that it's mostly Caucasians represented. You know, the European figure is represented by what you see. But in actuality, you think about the demographics of the land and you say, well, that can't be. Like, what's happening? You know, um, you see palaces in Africa and you see how immaculate they is and like how grand they are and how beautiful they are. But you think about all the movies where you've seen kings and queens and princesses and you never seen an African palace in a royalty movie. But I was going to ask you, like, like, you know, this idea that Jesus Christ has been so sanitized and he's just like, pure blonde haired white you know blue eyed white dude is like hysterical to me because it's like that doesn't make any sense and, and that's funny that you should say that because I, I say that all the time like and it started when i was younger like i think like well you think I'm, I'm like he gotta either be you know middle eastern or african he gotta be like it only makes sense that he be that way even in the bible it says her war and like me i'm very spiritual like i yeah. used i was raised up under christian mm -hmm. christian beliefs and all that but like it was a time like I exactly what made me sway from Christianity. I seen a video with this high ranking cardinal or something mm -hmm. bashing Christians, bashing Christianity. But he was a high ranking Christian cardinal, and I'm like, what? I'm like, well, how you gonna? I'm not understanding this. Like you talking about your own people and like you straight trying to discredit parts of Christianity, but you saying you're Christian. So I'm like, well, I can't really do that. Like. I believe there was a Jesus or, you know, maybe his name. Well, in the Bible, it says, announce me by my one true name. Mm -hmm. And I am that I am. So you think about Hebrew language. Again, speaking facts, you think about Hebrew language. There is no J in the Hebrew language. Right. So when you hear Hebrews talk about Jesus or God, you hear them saying Yahweh and Yahshua. Right. Yeah. You know, which would make more sense in my head because there's no J. So where you get this Jesus from? <laughs> you know. And then like, I used to get mad like when I meet people and they and they was Mexican, which is no offense, no mm -hmm. racism thrown. Mm -hmm. Like most people when you meet them and they name Jesus, you know Jesus. People say Jesus. You be like, your name not Jesus. Why you put that on paper? You go, <laughs> you gonna go to hell. Then you learn that like you can't even like Jesus is not even nobody. That's just a name. So I just threw up there. Hey, yo, call him Jesus. Which I feel about a lot of you know religion. I don't, yeah. I don't practice religion at all because I feel like religion was set to control us. You know, it's all part of the system. It's part of white supremacy and and oppression because. You think about back in the day when people used to go to the temple or the synagogue or wherever they went, they went as a big village, as a big community. It was like, hey, yo, then we going on this day and everybody going, we're going to sit up in the temple, we're going to read from these scrolls and mm -hmm. we're going to have somebody articulate the scrolls because he sat up and prayed for the last 30 days mm -hmm. about the discernment to articulate the scrolls to you guys. So, you know, that's how it was. Yeah. So I kind of like people say uh, um, prophets or of the devil and people say say sewers of the devil. But I kind of believe that if you spiritually in tune, you will see that mm -hmm. like you'll be able to have that sixth sense and see through your third eye situations that might come. Because I'm pretty sure we have all been there. We now caught ourselves in a situation to where we was thinking like, yep, I know if I do this, this going to happen. But I'm going to do this anyway because I told somebody maybe. I told somebody I was going to do this, so that's what I'm going to do. And then you end up doing it, and exactly what you thought was going to happen happens. You know? 
Yeah, speaking of systems of oppression, you've got an upside down American flag behind you. And, uh, you know, I, I love it, country in distress. I think this country's been in distress for, for decades since I've been doing my history and trying to learn more and talk to people like yourself and other people in different movements. And I'm just wondering, um, what does that mean to you? And is, uh, do you feel strongly about, about the flag? I mean, I don't care either way because okay. I wish we could go out with this flag and then like build a flag that represents the true America, the true unity, and the true camaraderie. We trying to show that is America. Mm -hmm. So this is America to me. Like people say, oh, he got the flag upside down. He need to turn it right side up. Oh um, no, this is America because America is upside down and it's divided into two countries. We got two Americas. You got white America and black America. And black America and the issues that we are faced with don't seem to register in white America. And you know, and that's crazy to me because like you'll see a lot of white Americans who have the same ideologies and beliefs as us and they come and share it with us all the time. Mm -hmm. And they say, I understand, you know, and like they really empathize because they understand the situation of oppression and white supremacy. So when you get the other side of America, the white America, mm -hmm. who be like, oh no, you just don't do this and you 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 wanna steal, you wanna lose, um, you don't have no job, you're uneducated, you don't you don't wanna do nothing for yourself, and you hear that and you think to yourself, well like, hmm, is that the truth? When when we were forced into slavery and brought over here to work for years, mm -hmm. for years, you know. I watch the Food of the Loom commercials now, and they say, the touch, the feel, the fabric of our lives. Well, how did that become the fabric of your lives then? Who who helped do that? I mean, because I could have sworn that my ancestors did that. You know, I could have sworn that we helped build the fabric of your lives. I see, I see these same colonial style homes that you guys sit in, these Victorian style homes you guys sit in, and you know, you try to act like you so high above the world in them homes, but my people helped build them homes. You know, I see these Fortune 500 CEO skyscrapers you guys build and these land moists that you guys are so proud of. My people help build those. You know, so it's like, how can you take some pride into something more than me? And like, my family helped build it just like your family did. You know, what makes your family more special than mine? Oh, because you got privilege. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you think that you're entitled to that because that's what your people did. And your people high. And like, I don't know, like, cause I don't want to sound like I'm like bashing white people, cause I got a lot of people in my immediate family that are white, like they're not blood related to me, but they're my immediate family, and I love them to death. But you mean what you, you say? You know, but I mean what I say, and for real, like I told them this a couple of times, like, and, and just to test the waters, I used to sit with some of my white friends and say, let's tell racist jokes. Every time, even though I initiated and told them let's tell racist jokes, every time I got in my feelings, because. Black people don't tell that, man. We don't got that many racist jokes. We not gonna, what they call us, coon, spicks, um, niggas, monkeys, porch monkeys, um, um, what, whatever. I can go on for days. You know, only thing we got is cracker, hunky, and redneck. <laughs> yeah. Like, and it's not even doing no effects no more, you know? Right. It, so, does, it just certainly doesn't have the same effect that, like, the N-word has. Yeah, or, or coon, or, yeah, or, the or a jiggaboo, yeah, yeah. yeah, or, you know, you like, Absolutely. Like, you, can, you can call me a nigga 50 different ways. I can only say we're in that hunky or cracker, you know? And so it's like, that used to irk my soul. Like, even though I said, let's do this, let's tell racist jokes. But when you sit back and you see how deep racism is for real, it's kind of scary. See, so stuff like that made me conscious because I had friends that I can sit back and do that with. And they got that aggression off, you know? They, I, they might have wanted to do it to a lot of black people. So yeah, they got that aggression off. But if you're not willing to accept criticism, I'm not, I believe it. I'm not no, I'm a peaceful guy by all means, but I'm not no fool. I'm not no dummy. I'm not going to let anybody railroad me. I'm 6'4". I weigh 250 pounds. I'm definitely not that big for nothing. Like, I didn't get big just sitting around saying, hey, I'm black. You know, so, like, I'm definitely not going to let nobody railroad me at all. But I sat there and I took that to humble myself and understand, like, are you racist because you are uneducated or is you racist just because you hate me in the color of my skin? You know, because it's a lot of people who are uneducated to what's really going on. 
you know, and white people in particular, when you're uneducated to what's going on, that's privilege. I'm sorry. You know, white people don't like to admit that, but that's called privilege when you're uneducated to what's going on around you. And for all the black people who are uneducated on what's going on, I don't know what's wrong with you. Either your people's help, I mean, either your people's help sell the slaves or you just dumb. And that's just real. Like, because if you're still out here doing whatever you were doing before this happened, like this not a factor in your life. No, I'm saying take care of your kids. Take care of your home if that's what you're doing. But make sure that you spend your extra time trying to figure out how to better yourself and how to better your community. Because if we don't stick together and love and empower each other, we're going to keep getting railroaded and pushed to the bottom of society. And they're going to keep killing us, laying us down in the street. And your, your cousin, your brother, your sister, your nephew, your son, you know, daughter, brother, whatever, can be the next Mike Brown, next Trayvon Moore, next Von Dur, next Kajimi Powell. You know, that could be you. It could be, it could be any one of us at any given time. And no, they don't have to be your family for you to stand up. I'm pretty sure this is not the first time you had a brush with police brutality and it's definitely not going to be the last unless we take a stand and then we said we fired up and we ain't going to take it no more. You know, I got a saying I like to say, our elders used to say, um, we shall overcome. And, you know, excuse my language, but me, I feel like our generation should be standing up screaming, we ain't going to take that shit. You know, and that's just honest. You know, that's just being honest. It's just like, you can only take it for so much and you think about, like, how deep it is. 400 years worth of slavery and oppression. And then, like, even now, we're still dealing with it on a scale that's so big. That's so major that they just freed slavery, slaves out of Missouri less than what, 150 years ago, maybe 200 at the most, somewhere in between that timeline. Like slavery is still fresh in the in Missourians' brains. That's fresh. It's not, you know, it's certain spots you can go out here in the South Side City area and see underground tunnels. You know, you go under the old Bush Stadium where it used to be, it's underground passages all through there. You know, so you can see that it's real. Like that, that, that passion, that pain that everybody call anger when they saying that we gonna go um, to these hospitals and hurt people. Come on, now we human beings, just like anybody else. We got family too. Mm -hmm. If my family was in the hospital and um, white America decided to raise, oh, let's say pumpkin fest type of style, just for no reason, and my kids get hurt in the hospital, you don't think I'm be upset? No. So you don't think I'm going to have a common courtesy for somebody else who in the hospital probably died? Look, I just lost my mother five years ago to COPD and emphysema and cancer. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody would have did anything in that process to make me lose my mother fast, I lost my mind. So what do we look like saying that we want justice and end police brutality, but we sitting up here being brutes and going to protest at a hospital? For what? Yeah, they do their job. They save life. That's just like protesting at a fire department. They do their job. They save lives. I protest bro police and police brutality because they do not do their job. They enforce these stupid laws that shouldn't be enforced that put us all in a, in a stance to where we can't take care of ourselves. Oh, well, you don't have those problems? Oh, well, welcome to my reality. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's real. I have those problems. You know, and it's hard for me to get a lawyer because I come from plots, you know, I come from spots where it's hard to get up. Oh, you say you can do better? Well, guess what? I tried to do better. You know, I, I done had plenty of jobs. They all end up dead in. You know, I'm a hard worker. I know how to do a little bit of everything. My mom used to always tell me, boy, you the jack of trades, but you the master of none. And I ain't understand that until I got older. You know what I'm saying? I can do so many different things, but I can't master one thing. Why? Because I can't. This society not meant for a guy like me to master one thing. You know, if I go to school and I get educated, I like to pay attention to issues. They're going to say I'm overqualified because I know too much about what I'm trying to go into. You know, yeah. if I don't get enough education and I try to go get that same job, they're going to say I'm underqualified. You know, um, I tell people this all the time. I say a white man and a black man can have the same job. Right, work the same amount of hours, work the same hours at the same time, and you know, go home, live in the same neighborhood, in the same amount of house, right? And so, therefore, in turn, with that happening, we both have the same problems, right? But the thing is, on top of that, 
I'm black in America, so I got the same everyday life problems as you. Family probably getting sick, kid getting sick, car breaking down, um, house need this and house need that. Um, but I still got to deal with being black. So when we ride down the street and I'm waking up and I'm early and you know I'm swerving because I'm tired just like you, the police gonna pull me over and they gonna say, hey sir, you noticed you were swerving back there? Um, where the guns and where the dope at? It's kind of late, what you doing now? I need, to, I need to search your car. Can you get out of the car? Can no, I'm going to pull you out of the car. car. Oh, yeah. no, you can't? Okay, well, you're under arrest because right. you're not following the officer's directive. Right.